have seen some of you. There we go. The recording just popped up and said we're recording. So uh, I may have seen some of you at the markets in Lansdowne or um, Westboro and Ottawa. Uh, we're there every week. Um, I've had some folks running our stands for us for the past this most of the summer, but uh, I'll be there in the winter a lot at uh, Lansdowne. So hopefully some of you will come and say hi. And uh, with that, I have prepared a, um, I've prepared a PowerPoint presentation and hopefully it won't be too boring. I'm going to tell you a little bit about me and my background and then we're going to get into talking about mushrooms and mushroom growing. So um, I'm going to try to share my screen and pull up my presentation. So bear with me for a moment here. Oops. That share screen. Okay, we are going to start from the beginning. Okay, uh, so I named this presentation A Meander Through the Art and Science of Growing Mushrooms. Um, I've been involved in agriculture for um, about 16, almost 17 years now, and it truly is both an art and a science for me. Um, I want to encourage all of you to ask questions in the chat if you like. Um, while I've got my PowerPoint sharing here, I won't be able to see if you're raising your hands. I always miss those on these anyway. But if you just um, post in the chat if questions come up um, or comments or anything, uh, we'll try to get to those at the end or I'll try to pop in and check them as we go through. Um, so this is the contents of the presentation. I just wanted to give you an idea what we're gonna be covering so that uh, you, you know kind of what's coming and what questions we're going to get to. Um, so I'm going to start out telling a little about me. I'm going to ask some questions about you guys and whether we do some of those through polling or maybe do a, a chat question and answer or if we unmute a little bit, we'll kind of play it by ear um, and hopefully not mess up the presentation too much. Then we'll go a little bit about mushrooms because um, you know you all probably have varying levels of, of knowledge already. And so we'll go through a little bit of that. I like to talk a little bit about the history of mushroom cultivation in the world because um, it's pretty interesting. Uh, and so we'll go through that a tiny bit. And then the mushrooms that we grow and why we grow those. Uh, then we'll get into kind of the, the meat of it, the cultivation process from spore to spawn to mycelium to fruit. Uh, then a little bit about how to prepare your mushrooms for culinary and medicinal consumption. Um, the future of mushrooms, as I see it, it'll only be a few minutes and we can then kind of chat and have questions and, and hopefully be a little bit informal here. So, so a little about us uh, at the Fungi Connection. So Darren is my husband and I'm Deb Kelly. Um, we've been growing stuff together since 2006 and doing farmer's markets since then. Um, we met in 2006 and we immediately started growing food, which is something both of us were passionate about. Um, we are self-taught growers, having come from different educational backgrounds. We started studying mushrooms around uh, 2012 and dabbling in some basic home cultivation. Um, Prior to that, we had been, we started out gardening and then that went into more heavy duty farming on larger plots of land. And then we became fascinated for a little while with hydroponics. Uh, this was all in the United States. I'm originally from the state of Indiana where um, I met Darren who is Canadian. Um, we got into mushrooms, like I said, around 2012. And uh, that led to our first official mushroom fruiting for selling at markets in 2015. And then by the time we moved here to Ontario in 2018, we were feeling confident enough to begin full-time mushroom production. So we started Kelly's Gourmet Mushrooms on Wolf Island. Uh, we weren't very savvy about our, our naming, but we thought, well, we're the Kelly's and we've got gourmet mushrooms. So that's where we're going to start. 
uh, we felt like it would take us a few years to really develop our farm and our customer base. And uh, so we just started there and, and we got going. Um, you can see there that we traveled to Olympia, Washington um, to study with Paul Stamets. And some of you may have heard of Paul Stamets. Um, most of our knowledge up until then had come from reading books and checking out some of the work of fellow growers on YouTube. Um, but with every mistake and fumble that we made, we always returned to the wisdom and experience of Paul Stamets. He's a longtime mycologist whose research is often the foundation of many mushroom operations. He's also a self-taught guy. And if you have had the fortune of seeing the movie Fantastic Fungi on Netflix, um, you'll learn a little bit more about Paul Stamets, but his books are fantastic. Um, so yeah, we decided after selling our farm in the US and moving to Canada that we'd take a little bit of our money from that and travel to Olympia, Washington, the home of Fungi Perfecti, where we took an intensive cultivation seminar with Stamets, uh, which really allowed us to deepen our understanding of the scientific side of mushroom cultivation. Uh, so we moved to mainland Kingston uh, in early 2020, right before the pandemic, in hopes of expanding. Um, and so the pandemic was just like for everybody else was a challenge, but during that time, we got a little bit more focus on our uh, grow kits. And uh, if any of you have um, ever tried to grow mushrooms from a grow kit, maybe you've seen some of ours. Um, and then again, we were um, in a position to expand at the end of 2021. Uh, even through the pandemic, we continued to grow and, and mushrooms have really become um, quite a quite a product. Uh, a lot of people are learning more and more about them all the time. And so that gave us the opportunity to move to Yarker, which is just north of Kingston. Uh, in 2022, we've built a new facility and we've teamed up with uh, Huffman Farms so that we can do kind of more things together than we were able to do by ourselves. Um, we're looking at maybe uh, expanding to include more training for up and coming mushroom growers throughout Canada. Uh, we're expanding sales of our growing kits and um, we may even be connecting with other creative mycologists to kind of drive the next generation of mushroom agriculture. So that's a little bit about us and feel free to ask any questions uh, as we go along about that. Here's where I had a little bit of questions about you guys. Um, so I'm just gonna throw some of these out there. And uh, Sarah, if if I'm jumping ahead too much, just let me know, we can always come back to some of these. Um, my first question is, how many of you have ever grown mushrooms before, whether using a kit or another me method? Uh, maybe in the chat, just say something, uh, that you've that you have or I'm going to pull that open haven't ever grown from a kit but I've always wanted to try it yeah hey somebody there says they, they have with our kits we've got a not yet unplanned mushroom growing in their grass I hear about that a lot somebody else has used our kits we got some not yet okay great so some of you have a, a bit of uh, you've had some experience with this um, all right some more kit growers great uh, hopefully they work well for you. And if not, we can always we can always go into that a little bit. Good. Oh yeah, people doing some research. Very good before starting. Um, and I'll share our our website and information in case at the end if you if you haven't uh, seen our kits and things. Um, my next question is how many of you uh, love to eat mushrooms or grew up eating mushrooms? Or, and I'll combine this with the next question, how many just maybe recently started adding mushrooms to your diet or you don't like eating them or have family members don't care, love them, yeah, good. Um, I, my story that I like to tell is um, I grew up eating <laughs> a little canned button mushrooms, the little rubbery mushrooms in the can. Uh, that was the only kind that, that I really had access to as a kid and uh, my mother, hates mushrooms. Sorry, mom. Um, she keeps trying, but it's that texture thing. You know, we get a lot of people. Yep. Family, not too keen on them, but starting to be. Yep. 
And some and some of you probably grew up foraging in the woods. Uh, I didn't. My family were kind of indoor people. I was the one who always wanted to be outside and checking out what was in the in the grass and the woods. So. Um, and then how many of you, probably a lot of you who enjoy mushrooms have already branched beyond button mushrooms and into the world of quote gourmet or exotic or specialty mushrooms. And that includes some of the ones, oh, somebody has a cousin with a chanterelle patch. Nice, nice. Um, uh, so shiitake, enoki, these kinds that, oh, lion's mane is king. I agree. Yep. Somebody says they've tried enoki. Uh, I had the canned one on a pizza in Cuba. Went to the kitchen to tell them not to do that. I hear you. Yeah, I don't think I could ever eat a canned mushroom ever again. Yep, puff balls. Puff balls grow around here quite a bit. And uh, yeah, somebody loves enoki. And I then I was just going to say, how many of you are foragers who like to go out and see what they can find out in the uh, out in the forest around here? Um, we have. I have lots of people who come to me, somebody loves to forage. I have lots of people who come to me at market and will show me a picture of something that they found in the woods or that they found in their backyard. And they say, what is this mushroom? And what I always like to say is that um, I also love going in the forest and seeing what there is to see, but uh, I'm definitely not a foraging expert. Um, have a great friend in Kingston here who is an expert forager. And so we kind of work together. Whenever I have people who come to me wanting to learn to forage, I send them to her. And whenever she has someone come to her looking for a specific mushroom, she sends them to me. So um, as for foraging, I can't help too much. Uh, there's morels popping up. I think I can I can sometimes tell a morel in, in the woods and definitely a lion's mane, shaggy mane. But there are lots and lots more that, uh, yeah, I'm the same as you. I'm a little nervous to, to eat or touch until I've uh, spent some time looking through the books and talking to my friend. All right. Well, that's great. Uh, thanks, everybody, for responding. I just wanted to kind of get a feel for who my audience is a little bit here. So feel free to continue chatting with me. Um, and I am going to go to the next slide. So this is just my fun little photo or picture here, illustration of some of the different kingdoms. Um, just to talk a little bit about what mushrooms actually are. Um, let me minimize that. Um, mushrooms are, believe it or not, just one type of fungi. The fungus kingdom uh, has around 4 million species and maybe even beyond that, they're finding new ones all the time. Um, and so you can see here, we've got the plant kingdom, the animal kingdom, fungi kingdom, and then your little single celled guys there, Monera and Protista. Um, so the main difference that like when we look at uh, menus or cookbooks or, or different places, usually mushrooms fall under that vegetable heading. But in fact, uh, mushrooms aren't exactly vegetables. Uh, and the main reason they're not, the main reason they have their own kingdom is uh, because of the way that they get their food. Um, and the way that they get their food is they actually, um, oh, well, first I'll say fungi include all kinds of molds, yeasts, aquatic fungi, and, uh, and different kinds of microscopic types of molds and things that um, don't exactly that aren't mushrooms. Uh, so mushrooms is just one type of fungi under that big umbrella. Um, there are 10 times more fungi than there are uh, plants in the world. And there are 600 times more fungi than there are animals that we know of. But yeah, so the, the main difference is how they get their food. While plants um, have the chlorophyll that helps them produce their food by turning it turning it into sugars uh, from the sun, photosynthesis. Um, fungi live by decaying material in nature. So they're often called nature's decomposers. They help break everything down. Um, without them, we wouldn't have the soil that we have and the plants and all of the different uh, living organisms in the forest. The fungi are the decomposers that help make all of the other food available for all the other creatures. Um, so, you know, and there are obvious structural differences. You don't have stems, you don't have leaves and things like that. Um, but that's how they got their own kingdom. Uh, they used to be lumped in with, with plants and vegetables, but 
that's how they, they became their own thing. And they share up to 40% of their DNA with humans. So just like humans, fungi um, breathe in oxygen and they put off CO2. So any of you who have grown our kits or other kits, you know, I'm always talking in the instructions about the problem of CO2 uh, because the fungi, um, they exude all that CO2 in their little grow tent and that causes them to, to grow really long stems and tiny caps because they're, they're looking for oxygen. They're trying to get up to where the oxygen is. Um, so they're always breathing the same stuff we are. Uh, and and uh, yeah, oh, and the other thing about them that's kind of interesting, they also absorb vitamin D from the sun, just like we do. And that's another reason that you can get a lot of really great vitamin D from uh, mushrooms, especially if you set them in the sun to absorb some of that before you eat them. So that's just to give you a little bit of an understanding of what a mushroom is, uh, why it's not exactly a vegetable. On the next page, we're gonna go a little bit through, uh, Oh, somebody said, do they also sequester CO2? That's a great question. Um, and I don't want to answer exactly in the affirmative because there's still a lot of research going on about what different kinds of fungi are able to do in terms of uh, sequestering um, carbon dioxide and helping protect the planet in that way. Um, I highly recommend uh, Merlin Sheldrake's book, Entangled Life, which gets really into the science of some of this stuff. Um, it's a great audio book as well. Uh, that talks a lot about the deeper science of, of all the different fungi and how they work with um, the planet. So uh, I'm going to go on here and get a little bit into mushroom terminology because I throw some of this stuff, um, I throw some of this stuff around without thinking of it. So I thought I would just go through some terminology before we uh, get too much deeper into this. Oh yeah, somebody there, Leah, you've read uh, The Entangled Life, wonderful, wonderful book. Um, someone says, Esther says, do they still have to be growing to absorb vitamin D? And that, no, they don't. Um, one of the things that we like to do with our shiitake, even after they're harvested, is we'll set them out um, gill side up in the sun so that they can absorb. Um, there have been some really interesting studies done on that. I don't want to misquote exactly the numbers, but uh, they absorb quite a bit of vitamin D when you do that. And, and we get the benefit when we eat those. Uh, Cameron asked, what is sequestering? I'm going to leave those questions a little bit because I can't, I can't describe the process of sequestering carbon dioxide, but it's really interesting stuff for the environmentalists out there and, and to understand um, how these fungi do those things. So um, let's go into some of these terms. One of the terms that people always uh, associate with mushrooms are spores, and that's because that is the um, that's the part of the fungus that grows into a new fungus. That is the reproductive part of the fungus. Uh, mushrooms make spores inside of their fruit body, inside of that mushroom, and then they drop them either from their gills or their pores once the fruit is mature. Uh, and I have a fun fact about that. Every year, fungi release 50 billion kilograms of spores into the air. And most of those spores will die. A few will become new mycelium but these guys are reproductive uh, masters. They are, they are putting out more than you can even imagine and we're breathing it in all the time. Um, but spores themselves are, are kind of like, well, I'll go into that a little bit, but spores, spores are kind of like, a, you don't know exactly what you're gonna get when two spores meet up and, and develop into a mycelium. It's kind of like a, a grafting, uh, and, and one apple tree onto another apple tree and you don't know exactly what you're gonna get. So um, we talk a little bit more in our industry uh, in cultivation of using spawn and mycelium. So those are the next things I'm gonna talk about. Um, mycelium is our world. That's, that's what we do in mushroom cultivation. So mycelium being the vegetative part of the fungus that's the part that consists of that network of fine white filaments or hyphae. Um, any of you who have grown the kits, you know that inside that lock that you received was all the white, uh, and that's the mycelium, the vegetative part of the mushroom. And um, let's see here, if you're ever walking through the forest and you 
kick a decomposing log and it breaks open and you see all that little white stuff growing in there, that's mycelium. If you looked at it under the microscope, you would see all these fine uh, individual filaments that have, have grown out of the spores. Um, and that's the part that's going to turn into a mushroom if it gets into the right conditions. Um, spawn is a living fungal culture that's grown on a substrate. So the fungal culture, this is something that we work with um, primarily in our, our lab. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in the next section. Um, but yeah, so that's, it's basically a mycelium, but it's growing on a substrate. And so a substrate uh, can be anything that the mycelium is growing on. Any medium used for mycelial growth, they can include grains. We use rye and millet grain. In, uh, in creating our spawn that we use to inoculate the, the next round of substrate. Um, let's see here. These are my notes that I didn't quite get printed out. So a lot of people for their substrate, you can use straw, you can use coffee grounds. You've probably heard of people using coffee grounds as substrates. Um, you can use pretty much any um, cellulose type structure, cardboard. A lot of mushrooms like to grow on cardboard, or um, you might have seen uh, like books that have been used to, to old books that mushrooms are growing from. Um, hardwood chips or sawdust, which is really common, and that's what we use in our growing uh, facility. We use hardwood sawdust to start. Um, we add rye grains and millet grains that have been covered with the mycelium into that hardwood sawdust to, to get the, the mushroom what it needs to eat. And, um, and then various supplements such as ground soy holes or wheat bran, different kinds of things like that. I'm gonna check here on the chat and see what everybody's saying. Okay, yeah, somebody's answering Cameron. Um, uh, can you use spent grain, for example, leftover from brewing beer? I have heard of this, and I think this is a really nice way that you could use a, a byproduct of the brewing industry then to extend it. The big, yeah, that's what feeds the fungus. That's what they eat. They like to eat that, that wood and, and all this decaying organic matter. Um, so yeah, but the big trick then and I'll get into this in the next section, is sterilizing that stuff, uh, sterilizing the substrate. Because in nature, um, all these different fungi are competing with other fungus, other bacteria, other molds and yeasts and things that are competing for that food. Um, there's some really interesting illustrations. Uh, I have another book to recommend. And this one is, it, it's a kid's book technically, but... Um, one of my absolute favorites. I always have it on my table at market and it's a DK book. If anybody in here is an educator, uh, I just love the illustrations in this book. And there's one that talks about the way that uh, mycelium fights with other mycelium for food. And there was a great illustration that I wanted to show you. I actually did not get it into my PowerPoint, but it shows right here these are two different kinds of mycelium that are coming up against each other. And one of them is going to win. So this is what happens in nature is one grows faster or more aggressive than the other. And that's the one that's gonna win. They're all looking for that food. So when what we do is we sterilize the, uh, the substrate ahead of time before we add the mycelium we want. And that way it's not competing with other molds and bacteria and fungus. Uh, but it's really fun if you if you ever get to the point of doing a petri dish and you've got a little bit of mycelium on the petri dish uh, and you see it start to grow and then you see this other little bit of contaminant because it does happen even though we're trying to get to a zero contamination rate um, it's really difficult to do that so you'll see this other uh, mycelium or mold or fungus trying to grow and who's going to win you know it's it's actually really interesting to watch. Well, if you're a nerd like me and my husband. Uh, so to continue on here a little bit, we'll get into some of that more in the in the next cultivation section. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. That's such a great book. Thanks for the link. Oh, perfect. Um, OK, so next I'll talk a little bit about fruit. I'm always talking about fruit bodies and the fruit of the mushroom. And this is because 
Um, in plants, you know, the green stems and leaves uh, and all that, that's the vegetative part of the plant, while the fruit is the reproductive part, usually having, you know, the seeds and whatnot. That's how it reproduces itself. So in fungus, we call the mushroom the fruit, because while the uh, mycelium is the vegetative part, um, the fruit, the mushroom, contains the spores, which allow the fungus to reproduce itself. So um, when I'm always talking about your fruitings on your kit or in our fruiting rooms, we call them fruiting rooms because that's where the mushrooms actually start to grow. Um, and then gills and pores. In this photo on this screen that I'm showing you, uh, these are gilled mushrooms. And that's what most of us are familiar with. You know, your portobellos, they have their gills um, and all of our oyster mushrooms and shiitake mushrooms. And uh, most of those are gilled mushrooms and the spores are living up there in the gills that they open up to drop their spores everywhere. Um, some mushrooms are called polypores which means they have kind of a, if you look at their, the underside, it's more of a dotted surface. It's like tiny little pores and that's where the spores are gonna come from, from those. Um, and then we have a couple of really scientific fun terms here, mycorrhizal and saprophytic, which I just like to say. Um, mycorrhizal, uh, those are the types of mushrooms that grow in partnership with the roots of various plants. They swap food with the plants that they've partnered with. And that term is interesting because people will often ask me, uh, do you grow chanterelles? Do you grow morels? Do you grow chicken of the woods? And that's just three varieties right there that are mycorrhizal. They have very special complicated relationships with the plants and their environment um, that they're growing around. So unfortunately, we haven't figured out, most mushroom growers haven't figured out how to replicate that. Um, and I like to think of it in terms of, you know, mushrooms are mysterious. Mushrooms don't like to be domesticated. So some of those, you know, they just are gonna resist domestication. They've got this really interesting complex relationship uh, that, you know, unless you build a little forest inside and create the exact conditions, they're not gonna grow. Um, and I admire them for that. Um, yeah, so, we have some of our favorites that we can grow and then we have some of our favorites that we just have to wait for and that makes them that much more special. Um, and saprophytic is a term that simply means obtaining nourishment from absorbing dissolved organic mat matter. Um, so that's what we grow. All Most of these fungi that we grow are saprophytic. Uh, we give them the right materials, it decomposes and they eat it. And, and that's what that's what they all need. So, okay, I'm gonna look at the chat here and see. <laughs> oh, never heard that about mushrooms before. <laughs> okay, and minimize that. We'll go to the next slide. Hopefully we're doing okay on time here. Yep, okay. Oops. Uh, oh, this is fun. And I had fun making this little photo for everybody. I think the history of mushroom cultivation is really interesting because we, I think, especially in North America, we've lost, depending on what culture you come from, uh, we've lost a lot of our knowledge of how to find mushrooms or how to, how they're cultivated, where they come from. Um, I have a beautiful picture here of King Louis XIV, um, who was believed to be the first mushroom grower using caves near Paris. Um, but in my little notes here, you can kind of see it's believed that the Egyptians were the first civilization to harvest mushrooms about 4,600 years ago. Uh, and even though nowadays we kind of think of mushrooms as a lowly little vegetable, uh, the pharaohs in Egypt believed they were a source of immortality. And they found them so delicious that a lot of times they didn't even allow the commoners to eat them. Um, Lots of other civilizations and who knows the exact timeline. I mean, there's so much in history that we don't know, uh, but they've been used in rituals all over the world, um, all over through the timeline. Um, some people believe they could give you super strength, lead your soul to the gods. Probably some of that came from trying different kinds of psych psychedelic or psilocybin mushrooms, who knows? <laughs> um, we think that uh, it was during the 1600s 
when cultivations of mushroom cultivation of mushrooms began. Um, and as far as we know, that began in France. Uh, so we think we think that maybe Louis the Fourteenth was the first mushroom grower, um, growing your your button or agaricus type mushrooms um, in caves, and then from France. Then the mushrooms began coming, mushroom cultivation came through England and then to North America. And interestingly, Louis Lambert, French mycologist, was the first producer of pure culture virgin spawn under the American Spawn Company uh, in the United States. And uh, at the Universal Exposition in 1904, which was in St. Louis with the World's Fair, uh, he received a civil, silver medal for producing the kind of brick spawn that mushroom growers like me use all the time. Uh, and I just find this really fascinating that as early as 1904, we had somebody creating these mushroom blocks. Um, and I'm fascinated with the World's Fair of 1904 anyway. So I just actually learned that today. There's still Lambert Spawn in Pennsylvania uh, that was started by um, Louis Lambert. So, oh, who's this? Oh, I'm just looking at some of the chats here. Are some wild mushrooms here non-native? Very likely, Steve. Uh, I don't know for sure. For instance, um, shiitake can grow here, but they're not native to here. And I don't believe you would find them just randomly growing out in the forest. Um, I kind of have this hope that as we continue to grow our shiitake and the spores get out there, maybe they'll, they'll uh, start growing. But again, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing or, um, or if it will even happen. Um, <laughs> uh, oh yeah, and Emily's telling Steve, hey, go check out Paul Stamets' TED Talks. That is so true. There's some really good stuff about, about uh, what mushrooms can do for the environment. And yes, Paul Stamets is the go-to. Um, okay, so much for the history. Um, I don't think I had anything else there. Well, it, we'll get into a little bit here. The mushrooms we grow, uh, in North America for at least the past 50 years, most people would have been familiar with kind of these two broad categories of mushrooms, buttons. Uh, a lot of times people come to my stand and say, do you have the regular mushrooms or, you know, the kind I get in the grocery store? And I know when they say regular mushrooms, they're talking about buttons because that's what we've, in North America, that's what we're used to. And then wild mushrooms, which are uh, foraged or forest mushrooms. And we grow forest mushrooms. Um, when we got started, um, and, and just due to the time limitations here, I'm not going to get into all the growing methods that are different for button mushrooms or the agaricus family. And that includes Cremenium portobellos. I'm not going to get all into that. Um, but suffice it to say, we learned a lot about that mushroom life cycle while we were practicing on button mushrooms back in Indiana. And when it came time for us to go, um, full-time as become full-time mushroom growers, we decided to go all in on wild forest mushrooms. Um, sometimes I refer to them as forest mushrooms or wood decomposers. Um, they're also known as primary decomposers, whereas the button mushrooms are called secondary decomposers. Lots of good chapters in mushroom growing books about all that, uh, all those differences. Um, and sometimes we simply call them gourmet mushrooms um, because they are they tend to be thought of as something a little special uh, that you can't find everywhere. Um, and like I said before, not all of those forest mushrooms can be domesticated or cultivated. Um, and that's just because of those highly complicated relationships they have with the environment. So now I'm going to go into cultivation part one. Um, this is where we start with our mushrooms. We start with um, we work with spawn, which is, like I said, a living fungal culture that we grow on a substrate. And contamination, when you are planting or inoculating that, that initial spawn, is the number one challenge for growers. Um, just like in the wild, that mycelium is always battling against other bacteria for the food source. And what you see here in these photos, that's my husband, Darren. Uh, we were wearing masks before it was cool, he likes to say. Um, this was our our very first lab, um, I think. Oh, this might have been our second lab. We did have a small lab that we built on Wolf Island. And what you see there in front of him is what, what we in the industry call a flow hood. 
So those are um, really uh, high, highly filtered. They're, they're, they're really powerful filters. Um, and at the top of that, we have a blower that blow that sucks in the air and then blows it through these filters to try to keep sort of a clean area. Um, and if you go on YouTube and have any interest in growing mushrooms at home, they have every kind of home tech you can you can think of to to give yourself a clean area to work with mushroom mycelium. That clean area is key because in the air around us, there's just more than you can imagine. Um, all kinds of molds and, and fungus and bacteria floating around. Um, so he's got his gloves on there. He's using a scalpel that he has heated up. Uh, these are all things that we learned at the Paul Stamets seminar. Um, and the picture below there is uh, a stack of some of the stacks of our Petri dishes uh, where we've got mycelium in different air, in different um, different stages of growth. So what he's got on the end of the scalpel there is a bit of agar, a gel, a gelatinous sort of um, substance that the mushroom mycelium can live on and eat while it's in the petri dish awaiting being moved over to grain spawn um, and, and then being added to, to the substrates. I'm gonna check here, it looks like I've got some questions. Oh, what was the pink colored mushroom in the previous slide? That is our pink oyster mushroom. Uh, yeah, Aliyah answered that. Uh, we grow pink oyster. We sell it fresh at the farmer's markets. We also do pink oyster kits and they're super, super fun to watch grow. Um, the pink oyster, I, I always like to tell everybody though, it's a little bit of a cheat because it is not native to Ontario. Pink oyster is actually a, a tropical mushroom. And so it gets that bright, vibrant uh, pink coral color. And it's just gorgeous. It, it, really gets the oohs and ahs. So, and I just took that picture in our, uh, in one of our fruiting rooms this morning. That was a mushroom that I went and said hello to this morning. So, um, yeah, and once that spawn, he's, he's inoculating a bag of uh, grain right there. That's probably millet grain that we sterilized before putting it in front of that flow hood. And he's going to put that piece of agar in there that has mycelium on it, seal it up, and then place it on a shelf where the mycelium then will start rooting around in those grains and, and, and colonizing that whole bag of grain. Um, and once that spawn's been introduced into our sterile hardwood substrate and sealed, it can safely grow throughout that little log that we've made expanding that mycelial network. So when you get one of our grow kits, that's what you're getting. You're getting, actually, I brought one from the farm today. Um, I don't know if you can see it. This is a blue oyster that is growing out of one of these bags of substrate. And the white that you see here is all mycelium that has colonized the block. Um, these are these little baby blue oysters that are starting to pop out. Hard to do this all on the screen. There's a lot to look at. Oh, thank you, Cameron. Cameron said, gorgeous. Uh, all right. So let's go down. This is the next part, cultivation part two, incubation and fruiting. Um, here's that word again, fruiting. This is one of our employees, Denzel, uh, who's a great uh, up and coming mycologist himself. We've got uh, all of our, our shiitake blocks in here, fruiting that you can see. Um, I didn't give a picture of the incubation room because it's honestly a little boring. It's just all of these blocks sitting there all sealed up with mycelium growing in them. Nothing seems to be really happening. Um, the incubation times and conditions are different for all these different strains and varieties. Um, but we have a couple of big rooms where the blocks are just sitting um, while all this is happening inside. Uh, and it's kind of cool because as the mycelium is growing and colonizing through the hardwood substrate uh, is actually doing a process called uh, thermogenesis so or thermogenesis, some people um, say it that way, but it just means that the mycelium is creating a lot of heat as it's growing. So uh, we don't really have to heat that room too much in the winter because it creates its own heat as the mycelium is growing and, and uh, colonizing those blocks of wood. Really cool. And some of those uh, species can fully colonize these logs in seven to 10 days. That's a lot of our oyster varieties of very aggressive, uh, very powerful strains of mushroom. 
and others take upwards of three months. Um, we're working with some different varieties like maitake, um, and they take a really long time. Um, and let's see here. Oh, and reishi, we're growing reishi as well. And once that mycelium has fully colonized the substrate, then we move the block into one of our temperature and humidity controlled fruiting rooms. So there you see Denzel is standing there and behind him you see fans. Those are for moving the air around. We've got an air conditioner coming into that room to help keep the temperature where we need it. And that big blue uh, tank in the back is full of water and it has a mist maker in it that helps blow humidity up into the room so that we, and we're always uh, keeping track of that using little monitors and, and uh, making sure that our mushrooms have just the exact conditions they need. Um, that's always been one of our favorite things, Darren and I, when we're growing anything is let's give it exactly what it needs to really thrive. And, and it's, it's really a labor of love. Um, and I've got a, just a beautiful picture of a lion's mane here that actually one of our customers grew from one of our kits. I think that's actually out in BC and she held it up and took a picture. So I love that photo. Um, and yeah, and then I'm a little out of order here, but once they're done incubating, we slice a hole in the plastic bag. Uh, and then when the mycelium senses the proper temperature and oxygen humidity, then it knows it's time to fruit, the reproductive part of the cycle. And that is when, when you get a kit, um, you're, you're getting it at that point where the mycelium is fully colonized and it's ready to, to cut open and let it fruit. So uh, super fun. All right. And this is just a little bit about, I get a lot of questions about what I do with my mushrooms. How do you cook your mushrooms? What do you do um, with medicinal mushrooms? And so I usually, <laughs> I always say I'm a pretty lazy cook. Um, I just prepare them simply by sauteing them, pan frying them in a little butter or olive oil, uh, tossing it with some rice or pasta or eggs um, and alongside other dishes. Uh, there are some really amazing, amazing dishes that some of the chefs we work with have prepared. Um, I'm always hearing about them and thinking, I wish I had the <laughs> ambition to do some of these really cool uh, dishes that I hear about. Uh, and people are a lot of times asking me what the different mushrooms taste like. And um, I like to say that describing the flavor of mushrooms is a lot like describing wines. You know, some of them are a little nuttier and some of them are a little bit sweet or earthy. Um, so it's always fun to hear what people think about the different mushrooms that they've tasted. Um, you know, lion's mane has really become a, a fan favorite lately. And I find that it's a very mild mushroom that um, just is a great vehicle for whatever seasonings or fats you want to use to prepare it. Um, and it's got that, that beautiful texture that almost makes it like a meat substitute. Uh, it's just one of our favorites. Um, the medicinal mushrooms that we're also growing, including turkey tail and reishi, uh, can be prepared by grinding them up in a, like a coffee grinder or Vitamix or soaking them in alcohol to make an extract or a tincture. And now I'm going to share another one of my favorite books. Um, I don't know if you want to get your, I should have given you this earlier, Sarah, so you could prepare the link, but, uh, this is Christopher Hobbs, um, all about medicinal mushrooms because even though it kind of goes beyond the scope of this presentation, I know a lot of you've heard of all of these wonderful medicinal properties. Um, Christopher Hobbs has an awesome website as well, uh, where you can get a lot of information about how to prepare some of these mushrooms to get the best, um, most effectively access that mushroom medicine. Um, and also, you know, just where to find some of these mushrooms and how they grow. So good stuff. Oh, fun fact that I also put on this screen that I like to tell everybody is that eating mushrooms raw will not usually hurt you, I mean, unless they're bad mushrooms, um, but our bodies don't absorb those medicinal qualities unless the mushroom is heated up to a certain uh, temperature or ground up so that the cell structure is broken down. Um, we can't digest it fully because of the way the cell walls are in a mushroom. Um, so we're still learning the best ways to most effectively access that medicine. I'm going to check the chat here because it looks like there are a lot of comments, uh, questions. Um, someone has asked, oh my, lots of questions. Roasting is a nice slow, yep, yep. Oh, how long can a fully colonized block stay dormant? 
usually no more than a week or two. Um, now it depends on the on the strain uh, with blue oysters and lion's mane. A lot of times you can put them in the fridge and you can delay that fruiting process um, for at least a few weeks. Uh, they will eventually kind of start to to get stressed. Like and like any plant that gets stressed, they start to fruit. That's when they get stressed. It's time to reproduce so that they can die, um, unfortunately. But uh, you can usually extend that out a little bit with the refrigeration process. Um, okay, let me go down here. We've got roasting mushrooms is delicious. Can you eat turkey tail or reishi or strictly medicinal? Yes, could you use powder or dried in soups or broths? You can, however, um, reishi is extremely bitter and woody. When we grind it up in the coffee grinder, you still have some pretty um, tough pieces of woody um, structure. I'm sure that I know that there are companies that are using reishi and things like reishi coffee, reishi tea, and they get it ground up um, pretty small. But I still, every time I've tried to, to kind of put it in food, it's not very pleasant. Um, I'm still working on turkey tail. Um, the story I like to tell is the first time we tried to grind up turkey tail, uh, it actually fluffed up into almost like a cottony like powder. So I'm thinking tincture, dual extract, which is again, that Christopher Hobbs book has some really good recipes in there. And as soon as I get time, I'm gonna play with some of those a little bit more. Um, it won't hurt you. If you do put it in soups and broths and things like, things like that, you just tell yourself, hey, well, it's medicine. It's not gonna taste wonderful, um, but it's really good for you. Uh, Steve says nutritional features for some types in addition to vitamin D. I mean sky's the limit. There's so many different nutritional benefits. I've got that, I think, in one of my next slides to talk about, uh, but there are some great charts in Stamets' books and Christopher Hobbs' books um, about the different um, medicinal qualities of different types. Someone asks, Philippe says, is there still time to grow a mushroom kit outdoors? We're getting a little bit late. You, you still can, um, but what happens is it becomes less predictable just because of the fluctuation in temperature and humidity. Um, it's getting wet enough and cool enough that they'll be okay, but they may slow down a bit and not grow quite as quickly. Um, let's see here. Is there uh -huh. oh, the library link? Fantastic. Uh, all right. Okay. I think we're caught up. I'm going to go to the next slide and make sure we're, oh, we're running low on time here. We've got about five minutes left. Uh, which I believe I'm at the last slide. So great. I'll try to get through this one quickly. Um, the future of mushrooms. This is something very near and dear to my heart. Um, as we know, many of our most important medicines have been discovered in fungi and more is coming all the time. The research is just insane right now. Um, scientists are looking at fungi that have been used for thousands of years. Reishi has been known forever as the mushroom of immortality. Uh, and so of course we've got turkey tail and chaga um, and all of these make chemicals that might be effective against a lot of diseases. Um, I'm a two-time cancer survivor myself and um, I've done chemo once without turkey tail and once with and uh, huge difference, which I know is anecdotal, but personally, I don't care if it's anecdotal. It helped me a lot um, during that second round of chemo, so. Uh, let's see here. Fungi make statins. They contain vitamins B and D. Oh, and I didn't even get into the amino acids. Look up mushrooms and amino acids. It's really interesting because especially for vegetarians and vegans, it can be really difficult to get the, the necessary amino acids that you need to help um, make your food uh, work nutritionally in your body. And mushrooms are a great source of that. Um, you know, and Everybody, I think, knows at this point uh, about lion's mane and its uh, cognitive boosting properties. I'm not getting into psychedelic and psilocybin research, but if you watch the news at all, you know that that is absolutely exploding. There's been such great work done on trauma, uh, PTSD, anxiety and depression, with psilocybin, and I'm excited to see what happens going on into the future with that. Um, you, you can find companies all over the world, uh, using mycelium for packaging and as meat alternatives. There's a really cool company, I think out of New York state called Ecovative, and they've been doing the mycelium packaging for Ikea. And I think some other companies, uh, really, really neat stuff. 
Um, and I think mushrooms will continue to help transform the face of agriculture. I really deeply believe in that and I want to be a part of it going forward. Um, I come from uh, lots of farm farm friends and family back in the States and uh, I, I love agriculture and I really believe in the, the ability of mushrooms to, to make things better for the earth and humans going forward. Um, that's about it. I know we've been asking questions throughout. I'm open to taking uh, additional questions. If I'm good to stay if anybody else wants to chat a little bit. Uh, let's see here. I'm just going to see what. Oh, Leah says, inspiring. Thank you. Canadian. Ge oh, is that about the cancer thing? Thank you. Uh, Canadian Geographic had a story of someone using specific mushroom to filter. Yes, the wastewater from his cottage. So again, this is a Paul Stamets thing too. They've done some interesting um, work with building mycelium berms around different uh, like like farm fields where uh, it would filter out much of the toxins. Uh, I took turkey tail during chemo. Yes, and I actually took it as a powdered supplement that I got from a uh, host defense from Fungi Perfecti, it's Paul Stamets company. I just took that because I knew uh, what was in it. Um, uh, and I felt good about it. And we weren't at a point yet to be able to grind up our own. Uh, I'm a big fan of that company though. Um, yeah. So those are, if anybody else has any questions, I'm looking at the chat here. Uh, you're welcome. I didn't put my website and everything on here, but we're the Fungi Connection. You can find us online. We're Facebook, Instagram, at our website. Oh, thank you. That's so nice. Thanks, Steve. Uh, thanks, Michelle. Um, yeah, and feel free to email me or text. Uh, always happy to talk mushrooms with anyone. Oh, best mushrooms to grow perennially and outdoors. I would say, I mean, the blue oyster just about can't be beat. It's so aggressive that mycelium just holds on through, through cold rain, freeze, whatever. Oh, uh, thanks. Uh, the photography is only beautiful because the mushrooms are beautiful. That's what I say. We give them the conditions and they just... They are their own beautiful art. We don't sell my talkie yet at Lansdowne. We're still we're still practicing with my talkie. Um, I'm I'm a little bit. Uh, I get to try out all of the experimental my talkie that we're working on right now. It's my absolute favorite. Oh, uh, thanks, Cameron. Thank you for coming. Uh, oh, I do, Susan. I will share her name. Uh, that's my foraging friend. Um, maybe send me an email. And I'll, I'll send you her contact info. Um, I don't know if I should say it right here, uh, but I'll definitely share it with anyone who wants to know. Forging groups in the region, very little luck. Um, Annie, again, send me an email about that and I will see if I can connect you with my foraging connection. She's in Kingston, but she knows everybody. Um, you can also look up, I'm not sure if Ottawa has a mycological society. I should know that, but I don't. Toronto has a mycological society. Um, found some mystery mycelium in a log that was beautiful and I'd like to identify it. Yeah, the question is whether or not that mycelium will actually fruit from the log. It's hard to say. Um, you know, one of the interesting things we always talk about is we can grow morel mycelium all day long, grow the mycelium like crazy, but getting it to fruit is a whole other story. So. I, I can't say for sure whether you would. Oh, there's a name Cameron shared. Uh, uh, Alexis Nicole Black Forager is a cool source for foraging content. Is that a website, Cameron? Forager B on Instagram, Calabogie area. Uh huh. So it looks like uh, several people on the on the chat um, have been sharing a little bit of their information about foraging. Uh, content creator on TikTok. Yeah, this is the thing. Social media is just awash with plenty of foraging resources. Um, make sure you know your source and trust your, your person. But uh, there are a lot of really great folks out there, especially, uh, you know, Northern Quebec has some of the best foraging around. And I, I've never been there, but uh, there's some really good folks up there. Um, Learn your land on YouTube, very great. Oh, thanks, Susan. <laughs> Some guy started a mic. It's okay, Marco, it's all recorded so you can see it. 
uh, think fungi has started my, yes, think fungi. I have heard from him. Um, he's got a mycological society in Ottawa and he's combining lots of different uh, mycological resources from all over um, to share. Uh, oh, thanks, Julie. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so this is recording i think uh sarah will be available um and again if you have questions i'm i love talking mushrooms good night leah thanks <laughs> thanks emily have a good night <laughs> Hey, I think uh, the questions are over for this evening. So thank you, Deb, so much for your presentation. It was lovely hearing everything about mushrooms and the science of growing and, and eating mushrooms, your resources. <laughs> thank you. And with that, I'll stop. Yeah.